Good evening from Washington. I'm Laura Ingram, and this is the Ingram Angle. Coming up, huge news night the return of three hostages from North Korea. Well, it should have been a cause for a big celebration, but that's not how the opponents of the president saw it. Plus, an administration official is smeared as a racist for comments on immigration, which are factual. We're going to show you how the media's anger, of course, is mis misdirected. And also, Rudy G. fires back at Stormy Daniels' attorney. We have our own revelations about Michael Avenatti to share tonight. We've invited him on the show. Hasn't yet appeared. Raymond Arroyo tells us Friday follies, uh, and it's all about the big change coming to a Starbucks near you. And ending the week on presidential promises kept, Listen to what President Trump said about the prescription drug reform, price reform, and what was rolled out today. We don't negotiate the price of the drugs. So we're spending perhaps 300 to $350 billion more for drugs buying from our drug companies. When it comes time to negotiate the cost of drugs, we're going to negotiate like crazy, folks. You can look at some of the countries. Their medicine is a tiny fraction what the medicine costs in the USA. It's unfair, and it's ridiculous, and it's not going to happen any longer. It's time to end the global freeloading once and for all. Uh, Alex Azar, the HHS secretary, will be unveiling uh, the policies in the coming weeks. We look forward to that. But first tonight, never Trumper George F. Will takes a high dive, uh, sadly, off the deep end. His piece in the Washington Post on Wednesday was headlined, Trump is no longer the worst person in government. Now, can you guess who is? No, it's not, no, 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 not Scott Pruitt. No, no, it's Vice President Mike Pence. Low-key, self-effacing, and loyal Mike Pence? How could that possibly be? Well, George Will has a conspiracy theory, and it's a whopper. He wrote the following. Mike Pence, with his talent for toadyism and appetite for obsequiousness, could, Trump knew, become America's most repulsive public figure. Well, Will's theory is that Trump picked Pence because America would have such a revulsion for his VP, it would take the heat off the president himself. But there's a tiny little flaw in this theory. What makes Pence so repulsive, exactly? Well, as proof, Will cited the Post's calculations that during a cabinet meeting, Pence praised Trump once every 12 seconds for about three minutes, with such hideous comments as, quote, I am deeply humbled. I guess you can't say that. Now, Will doesn't just find Pence's humility repulsive. He also seems to have some kind of issue with Pence's faith. Will wrote, quote, Pence, one of e evangelical Christians' favorite pinups, genuflects at various altars as the mobocratic spirit and the vicious portion require. Well, Will was similarly offended that Pence would call himself honored by the presence of former Sheriff Joe Arpaio at a gathering in Tempe, Arizona. The Veep called Arpaio, quote, a tireless champion of the rule of law. According to Will, Pence's repulsive humility, piety, and respect for the law make him, quote, the authentic voice of today's lickspittle Republican Party. Well, Will's absurd accusations were gleefully picked up by the feedback loop on the left as an opportunity to smear the vice president. Who is Mike Pence? I don't know. You know, he, he, he doesn't really seem to have core convictions or beliefs beyond whatever Donald Trump's decided they are. He's striking this balance, trying to be, you know, the man that uh, will inherit the mantle of Trump, but at the expense of his own persona. There are two kinds of vice presidents. There are those who are accused of being so out for themselves and nursing their own ambitions that they're not uh, uh, serving the president who picked them. And there are those who are accused of being slavishly loyal, lapdogs, and so forth. Mike Pence has decided to be the former, or the latter, that is. He is a titanic and I mean titanic fraud. He is the most obsequious of all of Trump's cultists in the cabinet. We have never seen such slobbering servility by a high government official in this country than we do with Mike, P Mike Pence. Consider the source, my friends. Is Pence really the worst person in government? And why are the Pence haters 
lashing out now. It's very interesting. Let's ask the vice president's former press secretary, Mark Lauder, Matt Schlapp, of the, he's the chairman of the American Conservative Union and Democratic Party activist, Chris Hahn. Uh, Mark, let's go to you. Uh, I've known Mike Pence since, oh gosh, when he was in Congress. He used to actually fill in for me occasionally on radio. We still joke about it. Uh, I found that from George Will actually really sad. He's had an unbelievable career as one of the premier uh, columnists, writers in the United States. He obviously doesn't like Donald Trump. That's fine. But I thought it was filled with such low blows. And I, I just say, I, I wasn't even angry about it. I was actually sad about it. It's not surprising. Let's remember that in 1986, he wrote a column that called then Vice President George H.W. Bush a lapdog. Uh, Here's a decorated war veteran, a hero who would later go on to be a transformational president. So I think George Will has a problem with vice presidents who serve or transformational presidents of the United yeah. States. And to get to use a baseball term that I know George would like, you know, the best players in the world miss seven out of ten times. And in this case, I think he struck out swinging at a pitch in the dirt. Well, uh, let's go to you, Chris. There were. I think there were overtones in this column that George wrote, and he was picked up by a lot of media figures, as happens on yeah. cable news. Someone writes something, we're talking about it. And he, he talked about how he genuflects at the altar. It, 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 was, it was imbued with all these religious uh, overtones, and it seemed really condescending to me, condescending about Mike Pence's faith, <laughs> almost questioning Mike Pence's faith, oh, you're not a real Christian. I mean, he didn't write that. But you could read between the lines, and that's right. And I, I say this as someone, I like George Will. And, you know, a lot of people don't like right. George Will who watch this show. I actually like him. I've known him for a long time, and it pains me to say this, but I thought the column was beneath him and filled with low blows and not at all in any way illustrative of the man who Mike Pence is. And he's a wonderful person well, look, and I think a very effective vice president. Well, the column got picked up broadly because the vice president decided to plagiarize Richard Nixon during the Watergate scandal that morning that the column was released. And I think, look, while I do think the tone was harsh, it's not like George Will said his opinion doesn't matter because he's about to die, which is something that's been said inside the White House these days. So I think we got to back off on this is such a bad thing. Let's face it, the vice president is the bootlicker in chief in this administration right now. He is the one who praises the president most. He kisses his butt most. And what's sad about it is that in 2020, this president will drop him from the ticket because this president cares about ratings. And who he picks for his vice presidential candidate at the convention will be the biggest ratings night of that week. So, Mr. Pence, you might want to so, stand up to this president uh, uh, a little bit because he's so, not going to stand by you yeah. in the end. Uh, Max is going to take a swing at this, but before he does, uh, so were you concerned about Vice President Biden taking on Obama? Because I'm trying to remember, oh, wait, he never did. <laughs> like, when did Vice President uh, Biden take on Obama uh, for screwing up the Obamacare website, for screwing hey. up Benghazi, for screwing up the, the trailing of, of journalists, for hounding people who applied for IRS status? When did Biden come out and challenge Obama's abuse of power? When did he do that? Well, Never, Laura, Matt, when go, did any go, vice president, go, when did right. any vice why, president ever really do So why are you really going after Mike that? Pence like that? You didn't criticize Biden for it because you know that vice president's role is to support the president of the United States. Go. Yes. Okay, so support why is Mike one thing, go. but what he's doing why is, is my, Hold on, Chris. Hold why, on. why is Mike Pence being attacked? You know why he's being attacked? Because it, it's this. about Go. pride and ego of these never Trump writers. They can't really admit that the agenda is the most conservative agenda we've ever seen, that he's actually doing what he said he would do. And you know what Mike Pence is doing? A man with a 99% voting record with the American Conservative Rec Union. I don't know what he ever got wrong, but I guess he got one thing wrong one time and all the time was in he, Congress. He disputes that. But. Yeah, he disputes <laughs> it. But the point is, is this you get attacked by these people. Because they think we're deplorable. They don't think we have any moral standing to make the case that do what Donald Trump is doing is the right thing. Uh, and I'm telling you, Mark, when you, Hillary talked about the basket of deplorables, Obama talked about the bitter clingers. <laughs> George Will, in this moment, has more in common with their view of middle America from, from where Mike Pence came than he does with the conservative voters across America who said, we fed up with these parties, we're going to go for someone who's going to take a wrecking ball to the old Washington way. It's elitist, it's snobbish, and it's unbecoming. 
It's unbecoming. And, and uh, so millions of Americans who support this administration are horrible, awful, racist, xenophobic, terrible people. Really? And, Good luck building a movement well, on that idea. And this no, is not the, and this is not the, not the first. Hold on. This is not the first time this has happened. The same thing happened in 1980 when the American people turned their backs on the mainstream Republicans who had another preferred candidate and elected a strong leader like Ronald Reagan. They did it again in 2016 in, in President Trump, and the elitists can't get over it. They haven't yeah, gotten Trump, the memo. Trump doesn't doesn't keep a you know a th thesaurus and Thucydides by his bed. Perhaps you know George will. You know it's always it's always the seven <laughs> syllable words that you know like nobody everyone has. To like look him up when he okay that's fine and I like yes. that because that's kind of quirky about Will I like that but go ahead Chris my my concern here is that the timing of this is curious they're striking out on Trump Trump's numbers are going up so they think they can gin up something on Pence I mean Trump's numbers yeah. are improving well, day by day by day because the results are there for the American people. Well, nobody's really going to base their numbers on Trump on what Pence is doing. I just think that George Will had a feeling about Mike Pence based on what happened in New Mexico when he went, excuse me, in Arizona, when he went out there with Joe Arpaio. Look, I think a lot of people have reasons to think Joe Arpaio is somebody who should not be touted by the vice president or the president. Joe Arpaio disobeyed a court order. Joe Arpaio, what he did out there was racist in many people's eyes. So I think George Will sees that. And he says, look, this is not the Republican Party. This is not the conservative movement that he grew up with, that he likes to see. And he would like to see Mike Pence be the backbone of conservatism to President Trump. Because let's face it, President Trump became a conservative about four years ago. Mike Pence has been a conservative his entire life. So if, if Mike Pence is becoming more like Donald Trump instead of bringing Donald Trump more like Mike Pence, then conservatives are going to have a problem with that. And I think that's what George Will was lashing out about it. And look, you want people to talk about it, you better say some crazy things. Well, you're doing good at saying some crazy things. And I just, all I would say is this, which is, do we want to win or do we not want to win? I know the president talks about if we want enough, we're tired of winning. Okay, but listen, here's the deal. Conservatives are actually getting more done. And we're in a window where we can get even more done than we've Azar. ever Look gotten Azar. done. Azar. Azar is going to be the, one of the big rock stars of this administration. The H HHS secretary is not usually someone who gets a lot of attention. I've known him for 25 years. He clerked with me at the Supreme Court. Brilliant. But he could have been a cabinet secretary of many. He could have been AG. He could have been That's anything. Right. But he's doing this because we got to get this prescription drug stuff. This has to be tackled the right way. He's going to do a lot more. He's an idiot. Bob Lighthouse. Well, got why? Wilbur Ross. These are these. Tom hold on, Mayer, Chris. John Bolton. These are these are people of real substance mm -hmm. who are doing really hard work. And I think it really irks people who are never Trumpers right. and a lot of the Democrats because it's like they're throwing stuff up against the wall. And I'm telling you, when Steve Schmidt, because um, he, he ran a great campaign with McCain and Palin, Where did he get when he wasn't words? trashing uh, Palin, by the way, uh, Steve Schmidt said this today. Let's watch. We've listened to this guy for many, many years in this country on his moral high horse, assaulting the dignity of gay people um, across the board. His moral preening is famous throughout the land. Uh, the same vice president who just swore in uh, Rick Grinnell, gay American, to be the uh, a new ambassador, ambassador to, to Germany. Germany yeah. Okay, so so if you're really a if you're if you're really. a, if you're a faithful Christian as he is, he's by nature homophobic. I mean, this is where we are in the country. This you can't disagree on some core issues without being a terrible, awful, rotten, xenophobic, homo. It's it's just the litany of stupidity. Can I, can I jump in on the timing? Yes. You're exactly well, right. Well, he didn't What's say he was homophobic. Hold on, he says he pandered to people on. who are homophobic. It's very different. Hold on. Uh, I, I'm happy that Rick Grinnell is going to Germany. Personally, I think it's a great thing for the country yeah. and for the administration and for and, and for America. But let's look at the timing of this. It is because if you look at all the polls. The right track, wrong track, it's improving for the first time in a decade. Trump's numbers get better and better. And you know the only place where Trump is a little weak is foreign affairs. And he's having all these accomplishments. What the Democrats are seeing is this big blue wave is starting to, is starting to go away. And this is why they're starting to panic. Uh, Chris, I want to play a, a bite from you from our friend Nicole Wallace, who's always been very charitable toward people who make uh, mistakes. She was on MSNBC today, and she got very upset about Sarah Sanders. Let's watch. How do you resist the temptation to run up and wring her neck? Why can't she just say, if a staffer said that, we're going to get to the bottom of it, and she'll be fired? Um, how do you resist the temptation to run up and wring her neck? Uh, she went, she went on like Twitter and she apologized. Oh, she said, uh, just, I guess the tension's getting to her. I used poorly chosen words uh, for that. Yeah. I'm sorry. I mean, 
I mean, they're talking about the comment well, made by Sadler in the White House that, uh, about, about McCain, yeah. which was an unfortunate comment made made in private that we was clearly leaked out. We don't even know if it was Well, hold on true. a minute, guys. We do not you know. You know, look, we, Matt, Matt, yes, Nicole Chris. Wallace apologized, Sadler should apologize, and the White House should apologize for that statement about an American hero. This all is ridiculous. I, is, I don't I understand Chris, why they can't apologize Chris, for anything. John McCain, I do Chris, not agree with John McCain on a lot of things, but John McCain is an American hero who should be respected and who should not be talked about by this administration Chris, as he has been, not just know, by Democrats, Sadler, but by the yeah, president have, himself. This is enough of all this. First of all, you don't know what happened in a private meeting. None of us knows what's happened there. They've I love all the it. moral judgments that come in. I think John McCain deserves his peace and quiet at this trying time. We all believe this. But he still has a voting record, and it's okay to talk about it. And it's okay to talk about him opposing the president's uh, nominee to be the head of the CIA. You know what? All that you stuff know what John legit. McCain said? He said, don't Matt, feel sorry so for me. Matt, there's so much nasty rhetoric out there, Matt. Yeah, but, Matt, but, there's so much nasty but, rhetoric out there that needs to calm down, and it starts but, at the top. But, it starts with the president. We well, see that CPAC, yeah. where, your, where your communications director now, said now some, you're some gonna horrible things CPAC. about Michael Steele. Where you know the apology about, there? Oh. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I think, Chris, Chris, we can go back, and I can cherry pick uh, the, the, the bright lights of the left in the entertainment industry, in the media. Now we're, we're threatening to choke people. We, you know, we're going to blow the White House. We're talking up. about you know, the all White the, House. You know, but, all, but we're, we're talk, if we're going to talk about vitriol, I mean, check out my Twitter feed any time of the day. It doesn't bother me. It's like whatever. And You're mine. All stupid. I don't care. And right, mine. So, but don't pretend to be like these shrinking violets. John McCain is American hero. John McCain is, had a conservative voting record on a lot of issues. He disagreed with the president on a lot of issues, and I believe he said it was last year. Don't feel sorry for me. I'm I'm going to fight my fight. Don't don't feel sorry right. for me. He's not someone who wants to be treated with kid gloves at any point. He's a he's a tough guy who can, hand, who can handle, handle himself, saying, and Laura, he's an amazing person. All I'm saying, it's really easy for the White House just to say, you know what, that was that was unfortunate. We apologize to the McCain family for that. They're going through a very she trying time, not just McCain him, family. his entire family. She called the yeah, McCain she called family. them. Stop it, Chris. Let's not try she to drive called the Megan wedge McCain. on these types say of Say something from the podium. We, we have Sarah Sanders needs to just say something from the podium. Look, we have policy disagreements with these people at MSNBC. Michael Steele goes on the TV all the time, calls the president the worst things, and then he acts like he has the moral high ground. The same thing for my friend Nicole, and the same thing for these people who attack all of us Republicans who stand with the president. It's We're different tired when, of when it's all coming of the from the White judgment. House. Matt, you used to work there. You know this. I'm proud it's of working It's different when it comes I'm from the White House. My wife works there, and I don't think you should. And you should you should smudge the characters of these good people. You shouldn't do it. Mocking and and before we I'm let not. everybody They're go, they're smudging their own characters. Take 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 a breath. Uh, mocking people's faith. If it were done uh, against an Islamic individual or people who are not like considered the horrible, awful, hateful people, Mike Pence has been mocked repeatedly by the popular culture that are fans and fanatics of the left. And it's been tolerated, and it's a wink and a nod. They think Christians are all stupid, knuckle-dragging troglodytes. Anyone who supports Trump is an idiot. That's what basically George Will thinks. And I think it's backfiring. So the left has got to try a different I, tactic. If, if you want to win, well, you've got to Laura, bring these people into the fold, not insult them. We're out of time. Thanks, Laura, gentlemen. Coming right up, uh, the angle dives into one of the most underreported stories in America. It's a scandal about race that the left refuses to discuss and the media barely reports on. The PC police are crying racism over John Kelly's comments on the problems caused by illegal immigration. In an interview released last night, the White House chief of staff told NPR... The vast majority of the people that move illegally into the United States are not bad people. They're not criminals. They're not MS-13. But they're also not people that would easily assimilate into the United States. They're uh, overwhelmingly rural people. In the countries they come from, fourth, fifth, sixth grade educations are kind of the norm. Uh, they're coming here for a reason, and I sympathize with the reason, but the laws are the laws. MSNBC analyst Malcolm Nance then tweeted, Disgraceful General John Kelly embraces openly racist and bigoted ideals. He would have been kicked out of the U.S. Marine Corps for comments fractionally close to this. While the Amen chorus on the left was equally indignant. As a daughter of Mexican immigrants, uh, John Kelly's words were ignorant, plain and simple. I mean, what do you say? It, it, that, that is his view on immigration. You see that um, mm. a strain throughout the entire, um, the entire administration.
to only call for those with STEM backgrounds, et cetera, I think is a really a narrow, narrow way of understanding how immigrants have helped to build our country. Well, while the left, of course, attempts to brand the Trump administration as racist, well, they overlook actual carnage. As the weather warmed at the end of April, 84 people were shot and nine were killed over a seven-day period in Chicago. So where's the nonstop media coverage of that? Crickets. Joining us now, Lee Habib, who pointed out that racism going on in, the Chica in Chicago in his latest column in Newsweek. Also joining us, civil rights attorney Leo Terrell in L.A. And with me here in the studio, Horace Cooper, the co-chair of Project 21. I want to go right to Lee Habib on this. Lee you wrote this piece in Newsweek. The numbers out of Chicago in just a very short period of time, so sad, so depressing, reminiscent of the wave of shootings and murders last year. Almost no discussion of this as we obsess on, you know, a comment that John Kelly made on NPR. 84 shot in one week, Laura, nine dead. It's Parkland every week in Chicago. And yet there's no media coverage because it turns out that when young black men and women die in Chicago, the press only comes out if they're murdered or killed by people wearing blue uniforms. But the, the fact of the matter is that this is carnage that's happening in the, in the streets of our inner cities. And we know what the real problem is. And it's not guns, because there's gun control there. It's not AR-15s. It's not the NRA. That's why the media won't cover it. We know it's fatherlessness. We know that where there are no fathers and where there are lots of guns, there's lots of crime. And where there are lots of fathers and lots of guns, there aren't lots of dead people and no one will talk about it it's actually the new racism Laura it's the marginalization of black death and the fact that the press won't cover black on black crime is a crime in and of itself Leo I want to go to you on this because uh, John Kelly gets uh, you know lacerated for comments that are uh, factually true when from the Pew Research Survey looking at the education levels the graduation rates the poverty levels of, of illegal immigrants and even immigrants as compared to native-born uh, population. The numbers are quite devastating, but nevertheless, address, if you would, what Lee said. Uh, there's some of the uh, points we're pointing out uh, about the graduation rates and so forth. Um, Leo, your reaction. Yeah, yeah I, 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 first of all, I'm embarrassed by what he just said. First of all, you know, my mother uh, had an eighth-grade education, and, I, and, I, and she, even though she wasn't educated, according to the Kelly standard, I'm able to get on the Laura Ingram show by being a civil rights attorney. Now, John Kelly has Irish ancestry. This country brought over Irish who were uh, criminals, uneducated, and had a allegiance to the Catholic Church. And this man has the audacity to challenge people who are not educated. I, my mother, eighth grade education. But I'm on your show right now because it's not how smart you are, it's what you do with that opportunity. And let me just be very clear. There's a guy in the White House who said, and please play the tape, Laura, hey, you've been to Detroit and to all the African-American community. Give me a chance. Okay, Mr. President, what have you done for the African-American community when you went into the community during election 17 months ago and said, the Democrats haven't done anything. Give me a chance. So okay, what have well, he done, Laura Ingram? What, Answer that for me. Uh, well, Please? Uh, first of all, he's calmed down. What he's done is he's actually done something called improve economic conditions across the board, which is why his numbers, even among African Americans, where he has a lot of work to do, his numbers, even among African American males and overall, are improving. I would assume that jobs and wages are important to all people, white, black, brown, Asian. And in fact, he's actually trying to stop illegal immigration, which hurts the people who are entering the workforce for the first time, Leo. That's a good thing for all Americans, but especially African Americans. Don't take my word for it. Take the word for it from people who've studied the downward pressure on wages that open borders has caused. Go ahead, Horace. Well, absolutely. First of all, we're talking about a 21st century economic environment, not a 18th century, not a 19th century, not even an early 20th century. You could get off the boat, not know the language, not have any type of marketable skills, and still succeed. Today, we're already seeing this. All you got to look and see is who came in the 1990s. Their children are not doing nearly as well. I'm talking about immigrants, many of them illegal are not doing nearly as well 
as what we saw in the 1920s, 1930s, all the way up to the 1960s. We are marginalizing these people by encouraging them to come when they don't have the skills necessary to come. All right, let me set some of the facts in place that indicate that John Kelly is absolutely right in what he said. And he said also, we want people to come into the country. We want people to be part of the American ideal and experience because that is our country. It's the lifeblood of our country is welcoming people in. But there are also facts that we have to confront. Here are a few of them. 61% of illegal immigrants and their U.S.-born children uh, live in or near poverty, okay, compared to 31% of natives and their children. 62% of households headed by illegal immigrants access some form of cash or non-cash welfare, including 22% on food stamps, 51% on Medicaid. 50% uh, of illegals uh, and their U.S.-born children lack health care. The reason why that's important is it becomes uh, another pressure point for those who need the access to those services in the United States. The poor, what the happened to the American dream? And we what, don't. What, what happened the, to the American dream? The American dream is harder to yeah. achieve if we have open borders and lawlessness at our border. It's harder for the lower well, no, no, income no, no, people no, to no, achieve. No, Lee, no I want to go to Lee, that. and then Leo, you can close it out. Lee, this is always the case in this debate where people start saying, well, "What about the American dream?" Well, we have a lot of people in America who can't reach the American dream. You pointed out fatherlessness. Crime is another aspect of this, Lee, and MS-13 and other gang-affiliated uh, organizations have thrived in this open borders atmosphere. Go ahead. You, you know, we get to decide who comes here and when and what skill sets are determined to come here. And it's America that decides. It's for its own people. Americans don't have problems with immigrants. We're so sick of this conflation with illegal and legal immigration. We have to have legal immigration because it's best not only for the American people, it's best for the immigrants themselves. It's plain and simple. My parents come from Lebanon and they come from Sicily. They were taken here and chosen here for reasons. Their skill sets and and their ideas and what they could contribute to the United States were picked for a reason. They were yeah. chosen for a reason. They waited years to come here. And they always thought it was unfair that people could cut to the front of the line and decide for themselves yeah. when they would come here and why. As do, yeah, as do many. Leo, real quick. We're almost out of time. Yeah, very simple. Uh, it, it's really a code for uh, racism. Brown, blue eyes, come on in. Brown, black, oh, ass. Remember what he said? We don't want you. You're not educated. That's the code that's going oh on God. right now. But Leo, I see it, to, and you see it. You have to come up with a new argument. These arguments aren't working. The, oh. Uh, Latinos, well, then, then, well, Latinos I, call into my radio show from L.A., San Diego, Oakland, Texas. They are legal immigrants. They happen to be Latino Americans, and they say, this has to stop. This is not how we came into this country, and it's unfair, and it's hurting our neighborhoods and our jobs and our environment. That's from them. And I, I wouldn't play be on this on a, I I play be on this your... on a loop, okay? God, we are out of time. I, we, oh, I, I, I want to do an I, hour. I, I love you all. I love Leo. I love Leo's passion. He's the best. Uh, <laughs> and and Habib and Horace. I'm sorry, Horace. I'll be on radio. We'll do this longer segment. Maxine Waters going on a tirade uh, for the ages. You're going to love this. Legos now are racially insensitive. My goodness, these are the Friday follies. You're not going to want to miss it. Welcome back. Time for dun, 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 dun. we need a thing. <laughs> Friday Follies. We need a little thing. We need what do you call it? A thing. We need we a don't thing. Don't eat into the time. Go okay. On. We start with the chairman of Starbucks announcing a new bathroom policy for all its stores. What could possibly go wrong? Here to explain it all is New York Times bestselling author, the Will Wilder series, and Fox News contributor Raymond Arroyo. Uh, Starbucks opening its bathroom. Well, remember back in April that controversy. Those two African American men, they were evicted. Not allowed to use the bathroom because they didn't buy anything. Well, now Howie Schultz, chairman of Starbucks, has announced a new policy. We don't want to become a public bathroom, but we're going to make the right decision 100% of the time and give people the key because we don't want uh, anyone at Starbucks to feel as if that we are not giving access to you to the bathroom because you are less than. We want you to be more than. So uh, let me just get this straight. So. <laughs> We know what happens when you go running on the mall here in Washington. You go to the public, um, you get the drinking fountains. Yeah. 
When I was training for the marathon years ago, uh, people would be cleaning their socks in yeah. the, and so you would desperate for water, well, well, he, and then you'd see someone cleaning their socks. God bless them, but you don't want to drink when the socks are being, <laughs> you know, wrung out. Cleanse. In the well, that's going to be happening in the Starbucks. We're, we're not going to be a public bathroom, but you are going to be a public bathroom. You're giving the keys to everybody 100 percent of the time. I've spoken to Starbucks managers in the last few days. They say it's a health nuisance. They have to go with like the hazmat outfits to clean out these bathrooms. And people, they not only clean their articles, they clean themselves in the oh, sinks. No, this so that's a problem. You attract the homeless and you drive away paying well, customers. Well, they're going to lose customers. One of your Time radio, to go to Pete's. One of your, your radio callers that's had annoying. a great idea. Rather than having this 8,000 store unconscious bias training at the end of May, the better idea might be put public stalls and bathrooms in the back of every Starbucks in an urban setting, and then, you know what you could call that? Unconscious common sense. That would be a good solution. Okay, well, I just like what he said. We don't want you to feel like you're less than. We want you to be more than. Can we make up those T-shirts? That is a deep thoughts from Schultz. <laughs> Free All bathroom, right. no Now, we got Mad Maxine, okay? Oh, Mad Max, boy. one of my favorites. Okay, this is Mad Maxine. Maxine Waters. We have to play. She was upset about. This is an Obama era uh, anti racism uh, uh, thing for, for car dealerships. The Republicans repealed it. She went on a tear. We are trying to make sure that we're making America great every day in every way. And the best way to do that is to stop talking about discrimination and start talking about the nation. We're coming together as a people in spite of what you say. Mr. Kelly, please do not leave uh, because I want you to know that I am more offended as an African-American woman than you will ever be. And this business about making America great again, it is your president that's dividing this country. I resent the remark about making America great again. He's down here making a speech for this dishonorable president of the United States of America. Having said that, I reserve the balance of my time and no, yield? I do not yield not one second to you. To not you, one second. Not one second to you. I love it. No, Ingram, I'm not yielding a second to you. I love, this is my favorite. She, not a second, no, no, not one like second. This. It's the not wag. It's the wag. But, you know, I love it. I wish Maxine Waters would get engaged and really collaborate with the Republicans. They have the that. majority. Colla no, she agrees with them on some issues. Work with what? them and disagree with them on the other this issues. Flood president. insurance, you know health care. She can find that, things to collaborate with them on. That little act, that was dishonorable. Yeah, that well, was you that can't was break lame. the house rules and attack no, no, a member. No. That's, All right, Legos, Lego. Lego. We got racist Legos now. Quickly, thirty TMZ seconds for racist Legos. Found Meghan Markle, who's part of the royal wedding, put part this of the up royal on the wedding. screen. She's, a, She's the bride. Yeah. They have created a Lego at Legoland in Windsor. They're saying it's racist because. She's not dark enough. Look, what? she has the same skin tone as Prince Harry. Well, so they're saying, this is outrageous. I actually went and studied and found people saying the Incredible Hulk was lime green in his Lego depiction. Some of the people who collect these things, That's he's the lime green. Hulk. And in the That's... Avengers movies, he's dark green. We need to be consistent. This is so ridiculous. Lego has also been charged with racism in the past. There was a Job of the Hut playset. They said it looked like the Hagia Sophia in Turkey. Hagia. Hagia Sophia. Hagia. And, he, was, Hagia. and he, he smoked a hookah, and that was a problem. So uh, look at this. So they recalled that Lego set. Now, Laura, I'm breaking news here. What? I called Lego. They are doing an entire Fox set of playsets uh -oh. this year. And the Ingram angle is one of them. They sent me. The first two Legos in the collection. This is from the Ingram Angle collection. We'll put it up on the screen. This is you and I. Just look at the fact. Look, look. Oh, how, why, why have do they I, gotten close? Why do I have orange hair and you have big ears? Th they have a full screen of this. I guys. look like Trump. It there it is. Look. I look like a female Donald Trump. Well, That's me. I have to say, I'm very upset about oh these God. depictions because like my ears top. look nothing like that. But I can see the likeness oh, in no, you, Ingrid. No, Maybe, that is, you know, you're a little lighter than that normal, is, but it's okay. It's, I'm finding that. There's, a, there's <laughs> inherent bias and implicit bias in Up that. And against, down. against natural <coughs> blondes. Okay? I take back the balance of my time. I'm not yielding I'm not yielding any time to you. I'm not yielding will... to you. Not a minute to you. Right, get, get out. Where's my gavel? <laughs> Thanks, Raymond. You know the uh, more Trump succeeds, the more the media complain. This was a staged production meant for television, meant for the cameras. Well, she'd know staged. Well, we're going to expose the total hypocrisy. Just one minute. You just knew that the media would have a tough time acknowledging another Trump triumph. Well, these killjoys actually found a way to criticize the president 
as he greeted three American hostages released from North Korea. He has a complete incapacity for human empathy. You have three prisoners of the North Korean slave state, and it's about Donald Trump. It's about the ratings. How soon will it be before we see these images turned around and you know put out on social media by the president as some kind of you know campaign message? Donald Trump's a former reality show producer. This was a staged production meant for television, meant for the cameras. Staged? Well, maybe Hallie Jackson is having amnesia. I mean, just four years ago, President Obama staged an elaborate Rose Garden photo op announcing the release of Army Private Bo Bergdahl, flanked by his parents. I mean, that was an odd deal to the parents. Never mind that Obama traded five terrorists in Gitmo for Bergdahl, who plead, pled guilty in November to desertion and endangering his fellow troops. So let's discuss the double standard with Fox News host of Media Buzz, Howie Kurtz, along with Fox News contributor Leslie Marshall. Howie, let's go to you. I mean, right from the beginning, Obama, uh, when he was uh, nominated, he went to that Invesco Field uh, speech in Denver. They brought in the big columns, the Roman columns. It didn't, uh, David Geffen was involved in producing the whole thing. It was, I believe it was Geffen. I mean, he was really good at stage production. Here we have Trump at 3 in the morning going to greet the hostages, and everybody's having a meltdown over it. Yeah, this is such a sad spin. I mean, the president went out there to give a hero's welcome to these three hostages, to make it about them. He didn't put the spotlight on himself. And, you know, some in the media just have to kind of mock or minimize or denigrate it. So what should be a celebratory moment for the country, let's face it, becomes just another anti-Trump story. And, and, oh, he didn't show enough empathy. He didn't bite his lower lip and feel their pain. Faint a tear. Yeah, you know, same thing when he went to visit the hurricane victims. Um, this is why people hate the press. It really is. Uh, Leslie, here's a, a Yahoo headline after this uh, release of the hostages. Trump cheapens North Korean hostage return with ratings obsession. Uh, the president made an offhand comment about how we're going to get ratings at 3 in the morning. That's just from Trump. He's just making a, you know, he's making an offhand comment. He's not making about himself getting ratings. This compared to Bill Clinton in 2009. Here's some headlines from there. In release of journalists, both Clintons had key roles August 4th, 2009. I think we have the full screens. Bill Clinton and journalists in emotional return to U.S. August 5th, 2009 when he got uh, prisoners released from North Korea. The double standard, I mean, whether you're Republican or Democrat, at least kind of have a modicum of fairness. Your comment. Well, well I have to say, and I am a Democrat who, who loves to attack the president every chance I get, as you guys know. Uh, but this one it should be about these three men released. It should not be about politics. And I have to say, I really didn't think, and I know lefties get mad at me for this. I'm just saying the truth here. Uh, I didn't think it was about the president. What bothered me was when he gave credit uh, to Kim Jong-un. And that bothered me because these men were imprisoned. Uh, they were in the dark. Uh, they were not kept allowed to go outside. They were not given proper food um, or water or medical attention. Uh, that was the thing that bothered me the most. And the comment about the ratings, although it is Trump, we do hope, Laura, we just hope day after day that he will become a bit more presidential and forget the size of crowds uh, or the ratings. Leslie, Leslie, there's a little inconsistency here. Uh, when President Trump was on Twitter attacking uh, Little Rocket Man and all that, he was denounced as crazy as bringing us to the brink of nuclear war. Yes, he's saying nice things about Kim now because he's going to meet him and try to negotiate, we'll see what happens, a nuclear disarmament. And I think that, uh, you know, a lot of things the president does are controversial. You know, withdrawing from the Iran nuclear deal, that's controversial. Bringing home American hostages, that's not controversial, even some of the media try to nip And I think it. nobody really thinks that the president believes that Kim Jong-un is a nice guy. I mean, he doesn't believe that. He says, you know, Chuck Schumer and I are pals, or, you know, maybe he's okay with Schumer every now and then, but they're not really pals. But this, this is part of the art of the deal for Trump, I think. And I think he knows that when he goes to Singapore on June 12th, this is going to be a dicey deal. North Korea, you know, no one really trusts them. We've had a long history of their going back on their agreements. Just ask Madeleine Albright. And so I think he goes in with eyes wide open. I just think it's very, very important for all the Americans who are watching the show tonight to remember how the press treat Democrats when they have some good news for the country versus how they treat this president when we've had multiple successes and yet the coverage is it's just not anywhere near balanced. Howie, before we let you go, um, do you think the American people are kind of tuning out a lot of this though now, given that the numbers are going up for Trump? Tuning what out? Tuning out the bias. I mean, they're, they're just treating the press like they're irrelevant. 
I think that a lot of people, I mean, particularly Trump supporters, but others, have concluded uh, that the, this president is never going to get a fair shake from the media. I call it Trump trauma, and we're seeing more evidence of it. Thank you both. And it might be the one question that the media are not asking about porn star Stormy Daniels. We'll look into who's bank bankrolling the man behind this media circus next. The president's attorney, Rudy Giuliani, sharply turned down an offer to debate the lawyer for porn star Stormy Daniels. Giuliani said, quote, I don't get involved with pimps. <laughs> Meanwhile, attorney Michael Avenatti has struck a PR bonanza with his 108 appearances on CNN and MSNBC over 64 days. An analysis by the Washington Free Beacon shows his appearances were worth almost $175 million in free media. But there are serious questions about who is paying Avenatti in actual dollars. We're joined by former advisor to President Clinton, Mark Penn, who raised the questions in his article in The Hill yesterday. And, Mark, you didn't think this article was uh, going to take off, but lo and behold, you, uh, he's mad at you, that Avenatti. <laughs> no, I didn't think anybody was going to be interested in it. And it just hit a chord because people had been seeing him appear virtually everywhere never challenged on who's paying for it, how is it being paid, where did he get these bank records, is it legal or illegal, and come on, is he a lawyer or is he a political operative? No lawyer goes on 108 appearances. That's not serving their client, that's serving something else. Well, and this is what he said in response to your uh, piece and your tweet. Well, too bad Mark Penn didn't do any basic research for his ridiculous piece in The Hill. Had he merely bothered to review Google or this feed, he would know exactly who is paying me, and we did nothing wrong, Ray, the release of the financial info, BASTA. I guess he threw in BASTA enough for, I don't know, effect. Well, look, he first surfaces on March 7th, which means that he surfaced with a lawsuit, which means he arranged to represent her sometime earlier. He was asked some questions about being paid, and it's not till March 15th that he shows up with this Internet gig. Now, he's raised $470,000. Where's the accounting of the money? Who originally paid for him? How, who really paid and what operation gathered these kinds of documents around the, the phone records? The banking records of Michael Cohen right. are, are SARS records, and it is criminal to release those records. Uh, they're obviously, you know, any of us have those records. If we buy something, we sell something, and so forth. Someone pays us something. How he got them, we do not know. He hasn't revealed that. He's very loquacious on, on various topics, but he hasn't revealed how he received that. I know the inspector general is very anxious to know in the Treasury Department. Um, but, it, you know, it's odd because you would think that his, uh, Stormy's first lawyer advised her not to break her confidentiality agreement. And he comes in and says, break it. Don't worry about it. Break the deal and then sue that the deal's improper. Well, her first lawyer's like, uh-uh. I mean, I, practice, I wouldn't advise a client to break a deal, but that's what he did. But it got him a lot of publicity. Right. And what lawyer would do that? What's about the risk to her and millions of dollars of fines? Do you think she's roadkill here for him? Uh, like she, I, she's dispensable. I don't know if he indemnified her. That's one of the key questions, because he did advise her just, hey, ignore your agreements. And very few lawyers who are really lawyers I know would actually do that. And then he comes up with these, with these bank records. Well, let me tell you, it's not just the inspector general. No judge is going to accept something like that without knowing where they came from and how he got to it. I think we're going to get to the bottom. Do you think that... Uh, for the Democratic Party, this aspect of this Mueller offshoot in the Southern District of New York, is this, is it working? I mean, uh, you know, Cohen is Cohen. Who knows what they're going to find about Michael Cohen? But with the president and the Democrats, you know, they want to unseat Trump. They want to get him out if they can. They want to resist him, stop his policies, but they'd like to beat him, either by removing him or beat him. Is this working? You've been around this town for a long, long well, time. I, I, look, I spent a year fighting Ken Starr. Yep. I do not want to see a reverse repeat of 1998. I think it backfired for the Republicans, and this is backfiring. I don't know whether the Democrats are paying for it behind the scenes, but I don't want them to, because the truth is, since Stormy Daniels and Michael Avenetti appeared on the scene, Trump's ratings have gone through the roof. The Democratic horse race has closed to only a couple of points. Got to get him off the air because he's not talking about the real issues that people vote on. He's distracting the country. It's a circus. All right, Mark Penn, great to see you. Come back soon. We'll be right back to close out the week. You don't want to miss it.
That's all the time we have tonight, but be sure to tune in Monday night. We're going to have a story that might just change the entire course of the Mueller investigation. That sounds big, doesn't it? It is. And we'll see you right back then. Have a good weekend. Fly your flag. Happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. Shannon Bream is up next. See you back here Monday.